Our next speaker for today will be discussing the topic, the relevance of media and communication studies in the context of a global pandemic. He is a professor of media studies at the Faculty of Humanities, University of Amsterdam. He worked at Indiana University's Department of Telecommunications in Bloomington, United States. Publications of his work include over 100 papers in academic journals and 11 books, including most recently, McQuail's Media and Mass Communication Theory, Beyond Journalism and Making Media. His work has been translated in Chinese, Czech, German, Spanish, Portuguese, Greek, and Hungarian. He holds honorary appointments at the Faculty of Journalism at Lomonosov Moscow State University, Russia, the School of Communication of the University of Technology, Sydney, and the Department of Communication and Media Studies of Northumbria University, United Kingdom. He is also the bass player and singer of Skin Flower. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Dr. Mark Duse. Um, thank you so much. And, 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 and thanks everyone for having me today, for, for, for tuning in. Um, obviously, like every other speaker, I'm very sorry I couldn't be there with you in person. Uh, um, but in a way, I am. Um, we've we've all gotten used to interacting through this medium. It is a true privilege uh, to be able to to speak with you today. Um, I want to make three points today that I'm going to briefly talk about. Um, the first one is kind of the, the the title of my talk: the continued relevance of mass media and mass communication research uh, for the world we live in today, uh, based on the argument that a lot of people throughout history have said, well, you know, the age of mass media is over. We're, we're moving to a new digital sort of interpersonal communication age. And I want to challenge that perception a little bit and, and, and speak to uh, how we can still really learn uh, much about what's happening in the world through this sort of concept of the mass media and mass communication. A second point that I'm going to make is just going to briefly touch upon a couple of things that we've seen happening in the context of this global pandemic uh, that we're all part of in one way or another, and how we can understand what's been happening in the world through the perspective of media rather than, for example, the, the perspective of, of medicine or, 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 or health. Um, um, and so how media studies and media theory help us um, understand uh, some of the phenomena that, that we've all been witnessing. And finally, my third point today will be about the role of media literacy in all of this, in, 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 in learning to cope with the media environment, the digital environments that we're all part of. And my argument will be in conclusion that a truly effective media literacy is in fact an emotional literacy. Is that uh, we sometimes mistake uh, media literacy for learning about technology and about tools and about pushing the right buttons and understanding and critically analyzing the media as a text. And, and while this is obviously important and relevant, my argument today will conclude that what is actually missing from this is an appreciation that media to all of us are first and foremost feelings. Uh, they make us feel, we project our feelings onto them. Um, and, and these feelings, these emotions are obviously what makes us human, but also that, that color any kind of understanding we have of ourselves, each other, and the world around us. Therefore, a media literacy is and should always be also an emotional media literacy. So those will be my three points. So if this is all the time you have today, you can sit back and relax. So you now you know what I'm going to say. And, and for the next 20, 25 minutes or so, I'm just going to um, um, elaborate a little bit on, on, on these, these, these three points. Um, just a quick uh, note, like where do I get these ideas from? Um, 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 as in the introduction was kindly enough to note that, that some of the work I've been involved in in the last couple of years has been on a new edition of McQuail's Media Mass Communication Theory, a, a, a book of books, if you will, a handbook of Media Mass Communication Theory that uh, the late uh, but great um, uh, Professor Dennis McQuill has been working out throughout his life. Uh, the book is now in its seventh edition, and I was very privileged to 
um, be in a position to work on a new um, a version of the book, uh, updating it. It, it was published uh, last year. Um, it, it was for me a passion project. Uh, I knew the late um, uh, Professor McQuill. Um, uh, we were friends, and 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 so it was a privilege for me to work on this. But while finishing this book last year, just before the pandemic hit, and when the pandemic, of course, hit, I realized something else is needed, at least for my understanding of what's happening in the world through the perspective of media, and. Um, so I was very honored to, to sign a contract with uh, MIT Press in the United States to write, um, you could say, sort of a parallel book, a sequel book. A book is called Life and Media. I'm currently finishing the manuscript. It should be out sometime next year. And in this book, I'm trying to talk about, OK, how can we understand and appreciate the world and our role in it through media studies? Like, what does media studies teach us about the role and the value that we have in the world today. Um, and, and so the work on these two books, the research on these two books informs my, my comments to you uh, today. And, 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 and of course, I'd be happy to share any kind of work in progress or papers or anything you might wanna know more about. Just find me, Google me, and, and I'll be happy to, to share whatever uh, I have. Um, so my first point, the continued relevance of mass media and mass communication in the world today. Um, and, 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 and let's just start with the obvious. I mean, um, um, in the context that we're, that we're in uh, today, I mean, we've just had the Nobel Peace Prizes awarded to journalists, of course, uh, including uh, the, the wonderful Maria Ressa at Rappler uh, in, in, in the Philippines. And, and the, I mean, th that in and of itself speaks to the continued relevance of, you know, journalism is, of course, the, 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 the ultimate mass medium. I mean, that's how the profession has evolved as working in the context of a mass media as deliberately sending its information to all of us and taking responsibility for that uh, uh, sending by um, staking claims towards telling us the truth, uh, verifying facts, um, holding the powerful accountable, uh, being ethical and transparent, and, and so forth. And, 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 and so, yes, the Nobel Peace Prize should, of course, be awarded to journalists, and especially uh, to these two uh, amazing journalists, Dmitry Kuretov in, in Russia and Mia Ressa in the Philippines. Um, there is another argument to be made that, that the people who would argue that mass media aren't relevant anymore often do so from a rather privileged perspective, often forgetting that what we would call traditional um, mass media, such as radio or print media or television, uh, are still the dominant media forms in most places in the world. I mean, uh, if you want to know how incredibly relevant and, and exciting radio is um, travel across the African continent where radio, specifically community radio, is the dominant medium next to um, uh, broadband mobile internet, uh, uh, actually. Um, um, if you wanna know the continued relevance of television, could travel across Latin America and indeed North America. Um, and you wanna appreciate how print media, especially newspapers are thriving, I mean, across, uh, Southeast Asia um, uh, print media are doing exceptionally well, and, and the market for print is stabilizing almost everywhere else. So in that sense, mass media, traditional mass media are still very much part and parcel of community life, of the way societies operate, uh, um, and so on. A second point about the continued relevance of, of mass media we have to look at the, what you could call the new mass media. Um, and those would be the platforms, the platforms upon which we now dress up our lives, like where we perform ourselves onto social media for our followers, where we, uh, um, uh, uh, I mean, we, we rent our homes out through Airbnb, uh, uh, we quantify our lives and document this on Strava and countless other apps, countless other platforms where we broadcast our lives to the world. And even if we are 
you know, confident in, 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 in tuning at, and, 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 and safeguarding our privacy settings, still whatever we put on a platform isn't ours anymore, right? It is now the, oh, it becomes owned by the platforms, whether it's a picture or a statement or, 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 or anything. And that in itself is a form of mass media in, in, in the sense that everything we do gets turned into data that uh, then gets reused for advertising purposes, for anal analytical purpose, for prediction and recommendation purposes. In other words, there is a true mass communication process happening both in, um, uh, in front of the scenes, as in us broadcasting our lives, but also behind the scenes where we are turned into data and that data then also gets broadcast, if you will, um, to countless uh, computers and servers and uh, um, 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 similar uh, devices and, and technologies all over the world. So uh, um, 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 a second sort of observation about how that the mass media, mass communication thesis is very much still at work uh, both in front and behind the scenes. And, and a third comment about the continued relevance of mass communication could be that if you would argue that fundamentally in a media context or a mediated context, there are three distinct processes of communication at work at all times, right? You get the mass communication process where there's literally only one or few senders and many a mass of receivers. There is interpersonal communication, where, where, where you and I are having a conversation or a small group of people that can see each other, perhaps even touch each other, and, 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 and communicate in a verbal and nonverbal way, uh, which is, of course, the dimension that almost immediately gets lost in a video chatting conference, uh, where nonverbal communication is so incredibly limited. That's why we have emoji, right, to compensate. Um, and then there's a third type of communication coined by Manuel Castells, who says, you know, what we're witnessing is the rise of mass self-communication and this notion of performing our lives in, in, on platforms, of, of, of sharing data, information, posts, updates, either voluntarily or involuntarily on platforms. Um, and these three types of communications are, are, are quite distinct. However, they have also collapsed because um, as you, Eugenia uh, Mitchellstein and, and, and uh, Pablo Boskowski write about in their brand new book called The Digital Environment that just came out with MIT Press, and they make a really compelling argument that <clears throat> our media environment is exactly that. It's an environment. It's not a place where we move more or less deliberately from one medium to the next, from print to, to electronic to digital, or from a, a, a magazine to a, a television set to a mobile phone. In fact, it's, it's much more ambient than that. And it's an environment in which we move through that we are concurrently exposed to that works on us in all kinds of ways as we work it. And, um, and, and in a digital environment, we can be simultaneously mass communicating interpersonally communicating and mass self-communicating of to some extent dependent on the specific technologies or devices that we're using but even within the same device within the same uh, little thing we can be uh, um, uh, chatting uh, uh, intimately we can be broadcasting massively um, and, 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 and sharing involuntarily the data about our lives. And I think it's really important to acknowledge this collapsing of categories, um, if anything, because that means, that suggests, that tells us that being mindful of the mass communicative process in everything we do is an important step towards understanding and appreciating what's happening in our media environment. I want to make a quick final point about the continued relevance of mass communication. And I do this um, with reference to the work of a very dear colleague and, and, and friend in the United States, uh, Professor John Durham Peters, who already in the 1990s wrote a book called Speaking into the Air in 1999, 
in which book he makes an absolutely beautiful yet counterintuitive argument. And he says, look, all this claiming that mass communication is a lesser form, a colder form of communication than interpersonal communication, that, that what is really the best form of communicating is, is two people you know, communicating in, in, in real time, in person, uh, intimately, respectfully uh, connecting that way. And he says, but what if that's not the case? Uh, he says, because in interpersonal communication, inevitably something gets lost. And what gets lost is our own distinctive, different ways of looking at things. Because when people intimately share and communicate, they, they generally do so in an effort to build something together, consensus, right? When couples are facing difficulties and they go to therapy, what is the advice they get? To communicate, right? to, 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 to talk more, not less. And, and Peters makes the argument, well, what, what if that's actually um, um, goes at a cost, a cost of losing our, not our distinctive worldviews, our, our, our specific idiosyncratic ways of, of understanding the world around us, and of losing the love that we should have for each other's difference, right? Because we, we should love that what makes somebody unique, not what, what the attempt that somebody's making to fit more in with how we see the world. And, and that's not love, right? That's just wanting everybody to be co a copy of who you are. And, and, and I was, I, 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 I've always been deeply inspired by this argument, uh, this, this, uh, this call for respecting difference of, 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 of loving, the fact that everybody is truly different from who you are. And in that difference, we find our common humanity, not in how we are all becoming one or something like that, because that would be kind of make us robots. So mass communication, both as a normative and a very practical and a sort of even technological process that is still very much part and parcel of how we should and, and could make sense of the world around us. That's my first point today. My second point talks a little bit about um, um, the role of media in the global pandemic that, that, that we're all part of and, and that has been such a profound force in our lives um, 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 uh, in, in, since March 2019, and for some of us even before that. I mean, let's just acknowledge first and foremost, the significance of the World Health Organization's announcement in February 2020, uh, where they said, look, this coronavirus crisis has the status of a pandemic. Right, that's when they announced that its status shifted from a virus that was infecting people to a, a pandemic of, glo of true global proportions. In that same conference, in that same announcement, the World, the World Health Organization said, but look, next to the pandemic, there is a parallel, equally fatal, their words, process going on. And they labeled this an infodemic suggesting that the way news and information travels about the coronavirus can be just as fatal to people when it's not the correct news and information, when it's conspiracy theories, when it's uh, 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 facts and information that haven't been verified, that haven't been vetted by science and by the medical, medical community. And that this infodemic is equally fatal to the actual virus. And to me, as a media scholar, um, this was a quite profound acknowledgement that the world in media, in this digital environment that I've just been outlining, isn't a different world from the world of our bodies, where the virus obviously operates, and the societies that we are part of, the communities that we live in. That all of this is part of the same process and whether that process, process is sense-making or meaning-making, making decisions that affect your health and the health of your family, of your, your, your children, 
um, of, of how you move through the world and make sense of that world. Um, there is truly no distinction between that and what happens in this digital environment. Uh, I think that's a what for me was a profound moment and a profound insight of the role of media in all of this, not as a sort of separate force, but as a mutually constitu constitutive element of the world that we live in. A second quick point uh, about the uh, role of media in, in, in the pandemic. I think we have to acknowledge the role of journalism in the world today is that uh, because we've seen two profoundly contradictory trends happening around the world when it comes to the role of journalism in, in the pandemic. The first one is how, journal how the world turned to professional journalism, to the most legacy mainstream brands in every country for the latest news, the most verified updates, uh, information to help you, help you make the right decisions for yourself and, and your family. I mean, uh, uh, visiting numbers, uh, clicks, uh, viewing numbers, uh, listening numbers all spiked, especially in the first couple of months um, of, of, of 2020, up into the summer or up into the winter, depending on what part of the, the world you live in. And, uh, but then something else happened, almost the exact opposite development. Uh, people stopped following traditional journalism and even use traditional journalism as you know the uh, as, as the basis for an argument how everything was truly uh, uh, um, awful in the world of of, of ju accusing journalism of not acknowledging the different perspectives that exist on this virus and what to do about it on the 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 whether face masks is a good idea whether social distancing is a good idea whether moving our entire society online is a good, good idea, and so on and so forth. People said, but journalism isn't giving us the entire story. It's just pushing a sort of a dominant authoritarian, um, a medical, uh, governmental kind of narrative, rather than showcasing the entire bandwidth of options and, and opinions that live in society. Now, Whatever your thoughts are on, on this, what is interesting is that it speaks to the significance of journalism uh, in society. And for all the lamentations of the last couple of decades about journalism being in crisis and so on and so forth, I think it's, it's important to acknowledge, and again, this is underscored by the Nobel Peace Prize uh, prizes of, of this year awarded to, to journalists, of, of how incredibly important the work of journalists is whether we agree with them or not. And, 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 and personally, I would say how much journalism and especially individual journalists um, uh, deserve our respect and our support for having to do their work under absolutely impossible circumstances. I mean, the number of journalists reporting mental health problems, feeling isolated, free, feeling that their work is meaningless, They're, they can't go to the newsroom. Um, um, journalists have been laid off in record numbers. Freelance journalists are struggling all over the world, yet they continue to do the best they can to inform us, to help us, to make decisions. Um, and, and I take my hat, I mean, that doesn't mean I can't be critical as an academic of the work that journalists do, but at least I can stay mindful and respectful, especially for the precarious circumstances of their work. Um, we, a, a third point about the role of media in the global pandemic that really tells us a lot about what's happening in the world is the acceleration of the digitalization of everything. <laughs> Um, um, right? I mean, in, all of a sudden the world is teaching online. We're having academic conferences online. We are, uh, we've moved uh, health and medical applications online at a pace that is, to be honest, uh, overwhelming, bewildering, uh, um, in, uh, impossible to keep up with. I mean, e-health, telemedicine are completely sort of normal concepts right now. Uh, I mean, these developments have been happening for a while, but this last year, it's just catapulted into the mainstream. Um, and this goes for pretty much everything, every process that was perhaps 
somewhat digital is now completely digital. And if it isn't, it's on its way to get there. And that's partly exciting in the sense that uh, to look at this in terms of opportunity and inclusivity and what is possible, it's a bit daunting in terms of technological challenges of uh, getting everybody involved to provide services to people, especially people who don't have the kind of access, the kind of motivation, the kind of skills, um, uh, the kind of economic circumstances that allow them to participate uh, um, um, as much as we would like to. And then, of course, then there's the, the troubling issue of, well, when everything goes online, that means all of us start producing mass communicating about ourselves, whether we want to or not, right? Either through a conscious, deliberate status update on TikTok or Facebook, or an involuntary sharing of our data with platforms. It's like, what happens to all this data? And the researchers who study this tell us, well, what happens with that data? It informs systems to make decisions for us, but these systems aren't neutral. Right? The systems, the, 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 I mean, whether we call this artificial intelligence, which I think gives the systems a little bit too much credit, it's just a bunch of statistical formulas. <laughs> right? One statistical formula is an algorithm, two is artificial intelligence. Um, that's giving it a bit, a bit too much credit, but the point remains that these systems are in the process of making decisions for us. I mean, uh, what kind of a price you get for your airline ticket, what kind of mortgage you qualify for, and what kind of tax bracket you end up in. Uh, and, and all those things are now decided by, by, by algorithms. And what kind of medical provisions are available in where you live? I mean, this is profound stuff. And there's little or no transparency in any of this. There's little or no oversight. In fact, there's not even oversight of the companies and corporations and government agencies that are involved in running this. And, and, and I wanna make one personal um, uh, anecdote that, that for me illustrate this. Um, I mean, I used to live and work in the United States and now I live and work in, in the Netherlands um, as well as in some other countries. Uh, I'm very privileged in that sense and I'm very grateful for these positions. However, it also means that I'm constantly struggling with you know, paying bills in different parts of the world and, and, and all that. And, and so I moved all my banking to online banking because that makes things easier. So I thought, so one of these services that you then use is generally something like PayPal. And I would transfer money to different countries to make sure that I could pay my bills. And that all, always worked just fine. Uh, until one moment, PayPal just refused to process any of my transactions. And I couldn't figure out what the reason was. So I finally tried to give PayPal a call. Uh, this was in the United States. And after you know, going through a Kafkaesque labyrinth of voicemails and assistance, I actually finally, after about 20, 25 minutes, got a human being on the phone. And uh, I asked the person, I said, like, I've got this transaction going. And he said, yeah, I can see it on my screen, uh, you know, all, all good. So yeah, but it, the, the, the system has refused uh, the transaction. The last five times it went fine and now it doesn't. And he says, yeah, that happens. And, uh, and this is an actual conversation. He said, what, what do you mean? He said, yeah, it, it does that sometime. And I said, what do you mean? Yeah, but the, the, the algorithm. It, sometimes flags transactions randomly or for whatever reason, and then, uh, then it just doesn't go. I said, okay, so what do I do now? I said, yeah, wait a couple of days and try again. We'll be fine. <laughs> and I said, can't you just, you know, approve something, you know, uh, make, it, make, it, make a change? You know, you know I, I want the money now. And then and he literally said, oh, no, 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 sir. Nobody can touch the algorithm. He literally said that. And I couldn't help but laugh. But it was a reminder, right, that one of the most powerful financial systems in the world today, PayPal, cannot touch its own algorithm. Nobody touches the algorithm. And, 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 and I think that's, that's the reason why this is so important, that, that this digitalization of everything uh, means that our data gets put into a system 
uh, and of course to a variety of systems, none of which communicate effectively with each other, that has no oversight or transparency. And on top of that, that the system isn't neutral. It sometimes randomly decides not to do something. I mean, it's almost like a human being. Yeah, I don't feel like it today. And, that, and I think that's an important reminder that technologies aren't perfect. They're not neutral. They're not objective. They're not cool, uh, uh, um, uh, disaffected uh, machines. No, no, no. They're profound. They're temperamental. They're messy. They're imperfect. They're charismatic. They are, um, they're like us, in other words. Finally. Uh, my last point, oh, well, I mean, very quickly um, to uh, um, um, finish this point about the, the, the role of media in the pandemic, and, and I've hinted to, uh, on the, uh, towards that point in my discussion of the digital environment, is that what this shift to the digital in the last couple of years has taught us is that it has amplified everything, including all the social and economic inequalities that exist in the world today, right? The shift towards online teaching showed us that kids that were already struggling were struggling even more. The shift towards digital employment shows that people who don't have those kind of skills uh, are struggling even more and so on and so forth. And this should be an opportunity for us to look at this more carefully and to consider the ethics of what we're doing. Ethics is everything. I would argue, uh, in a digital environment, not technology, it's ethics. So finally, my last comment today, um, 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 I know I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I will keep this brief. What the last couple of years have truly taught me is that the way we make sense of all everything that I've just talked about, the way we interact with our media, with our devices, with the technologies, with the texts uh, that circulate, um, yes, technology plays a huge role, role in this. Yes, our skills and competences to navigate this space are important. But what is at the heart of all of this truly is um, what scholars would call affect and what we more informally would say is our emotional life. Um, that, uh, uh, and, and I've just made the point that our technologies themselves are actually quite emotional. Right, uh, um, um, and, and are not called heartless machines, but in fact are, 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 are quite um, affective, not effective, but affective in the way they govern our lives, which suggests to me that when we talk about in, uh, media literacy, we should also talk about emotional literacy. And emotional literacy means first and foremost that you understand and appreciate how you are emotionally affected by news, by stories, by people's uh, social media updates, what they do to you and how that influences your decision-making process. And uh, I mean, we all know the rule that if you're really upset, don't send that email, right? Sleep over on it or wait at least 10 seconds. And then maybe, I mean, and that's a reminder of how our interactions and our ne negotiations and navigation of a digital environment is primarily emotional and emotional literacy is very much about understanding and appreciating one's emotions, respecting them, forgiving yourself and others for doing things in, in, in certain ways because we are emotional human beings. Uh, and, and the second part of emotional literacy is of course, understanding and appreciate the emotional life of others. And I come back, I circle back to my point in the beginning, inspired by the work of John Durham Peters, that the emotional lives of others is really, really different from ours. That there will never ever be consensus on emotional life. And that is just fine. The point is, is to appreciate and respect this and to, 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 to train yourself to keep listening to that difference, respecting it. And then you can still work together to make things better, but not on the basis of all of us becoming the same, but all of us staying very, very different. Thank you so much. For, for, for listening, for, for your time. I, I hope we have time for some questions. And otherwise, I'm always available online. I live in media uh, and happy to chat at any point. Thank you, uh, Mark. At, at this point, uh, 
may ask the panelists to uh, turn on their uh, cameras and microphones. I'm sure they have a lot of questions for you, Mark. So uh, I will uh, start with uh, Miss Romana Celeste Mauhai, Media Center Coordin Coordinator from Lyceum of the Philippines University, Batangas. Hello, good afternoon, Sir Mark Tuz. Thank you for that informative uh, lecture that you had given us. So uh, the emergence of the global pandemic has affected almost everyone entirely and manifested in how they really live a life, communicate and even share a piece of humanity in each and every one of us. So my question goes like this, how are we going to accept and adopt to the changing language styles and forms of communication medium as we still face this global pandemic coursing through the realms of reality and communication education, looking through facts that we have risk in communication, adaptive communication, centralized communication, and behavioral communication, which uh, somehow is being touched in your very informative speech. Thank you so much, sir. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Mahai. Uh, um, um, I appreciate that question. It's 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 a Pandora's box, right? I mean, I mean, you're so right that in this immediate environment that we're in, all these different kinds of communication are happening simultaneously. And how are we going to dissect, you know, the kind of the, the 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 centralized or governmental communication and interpersonal communication? Very, I mean, it's like different tabs on our internet browser. Right, the one is a, an intimate conversation on WhatsApp. The other one is an important message from your employer. The third one, I mean, it's all, it's a, it's a mess. <laughs> and, and, and I think what you're touching upon is, is a fundamental issue of that in a digital environment, there's no natural information hierarchy, right? Which in a non-digital environment, there is. Um, and we have distinct genres and codes for different kinds of communication in a print and an electronic environment. But in a digital environment, th th there isn't really any of that. I mean, we, we try through formatting and through tone of voice and, and certain discursive strategies, but ultimately we have l almost zero control of in what context somebody receives your message, your communication, right? They could be on, on the toilet with their iPad, or they could be walking on the street with headphones. They could be in a pub with 20 friends shouting at each other, and where does your communication go? Whether as somebody who wants to inform people about an important health issue, or you're an advertising creative trying to sell a product, a news organization trying to update people about the news in their communities, or you know, telling somebody you love them. I mean, these, that's all happening at the same level, the same platform, zeros and ones, bits and bytes. How do we deal with that? Um, you know, <laughs> so I, 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 part of my answer would be is to appreciate that this is as much of an emotional as a digital literacy that we're talking about. That is to, to handle your emotional response to all of this, uh, even if that's just confusion. So secondly, I think we do have to keep acknowledging how incredibly difficult and complicated media are. Uh, when I talk with, with, with professional communicators, whether these are media professionals or people, for example, from government offices who want to find more effective ways of communicating to citizens, I'm always struck with that they think that this is easy, that, you know, if we do the right things, press the right buttons, our message will get through. And I'm just trying to simply tell them that's not ever going to happen. Right. There is, that, that's as making an assumption that there's somehow a way through. And, and, and um, I would say what this highlights is that, you know, all of us deep down inside in our hearts of hearts, and I would encourage you and those of you who are listening to, to, to look at yourself, what we really want, what we love, and I use love deliberately, is that when we say something, when we communicate something, either like, like I'm doing now verbally or when I type something, that whoever receives that message will understand us perfectly. Yeah, that there's some pure communication possible where what I say, what I feel, what I think when I say it, somebody else will go like, 
I know exactly what you mean. And the problem is our frustration, our shared human frustration is that never ever happens, right? In, I mean, miscommunication is the essential ingredient of any communication. And that is a general theoretical point, but in our digital, digital environment, this is a practical point, right? Where does your communication go? How do you, can you expect anybody to appreciate what you're trying to say in this incredibly complicated environment? And we need to keep reminding ourselves and each other about this, that it is, this is a, a learning process that never stops. And yes, of course, we need digital literacy curricula in, in, in primary and, and, and high schools, of course. And all over the world, this is in development at the moment. It's, it's still rudimentary and basic and i sometimes worry that it's too much about button pushing and, and instrumental approaches to literacy but at least something is happening unesco has a phenomenal program in this and and not just unesco but local schools everywhere so that's of course needed but you know media doesn't stop developing when we turn 18. in fact it, is, it accelerates <laughs> the moment I figured out how to use this, there's like five new iterations of this bloody device available, and I have to start all over again. Let's just acknowledge that how difficult that is and, and appreciate that, that we need to keep learning and figure out ways how to do that. Uh, so those would be my three answers to your uh, really important question. And, and I realize none of them are very practical. <laughs> but I think it, our, our role as media scholars is maybe just to remind people, yeah, this is difficult stuff. <laughs> That's why we have a discipline that studies this. <laughs> we matter. <laughs> All right. Thank you, uh, Ms. Romana Celeste Mauhai. Right now, we will uh, move on to our next panelist, we have Professor Fillmore Murillo, Director, Center for International Linkages and Affairs from Camarina Sur Polytechnic Colleges, Nabua, Camarina Sur. Thank you, Ms. Tony. Uh, thank you also to everyone who, who is gracing the event today, Mark. Uh, very appreciative of the straightforward and very profound insight. Uh, I, am, I am wonderfully thankful for, for highlighting the fact that mass communication remains to be relevant and for giving us the reminders that yes, mass communication was able to accelerate the digitalization and also amplify the, you know, the inequalities that we are having at the moment. And I think very profound also the fact that you highlighted the concept of emotion because after all, emotion affects our engagement, especially in social media, which directly influence algorithm. So I would like to, to ask about something that you mentioned earlier, the infodemic. So I would like to relate infodemic then the pandemic. So to give the context, I think it's common knowledge that in some parts of the world, specifically in the United States, the pandemic has been usually politicized. And the, the, the politicking is very strategic because the intention is number one, to maintain the voters, and number two, uh, to get funds, to gather funds. Right. And, and, and because of this, it has been weaponized and the attacks is actually on two frontiers as far as mass communication is concerned. Number one is on the truth itself. And number two is on the trust trust to the people who are bringing the truth. So I would like to know what's your take? How are you, how would you rate, how far is mass or are mass communication practitioners coping up with this attack on truth mm -hmm. and on trust? And for you, what must be done to cope up, to adapt? Thank you. Um, Thank you so much, Professor Murillo, for your for your for your thoughts and for your question. Um, I, I really appreciate your linking emotion with engagement and algorithms. I think that's a profound insight that I really appreciate. That I'm I'm definitely going to take take home with me. Well, I am home, <laughs> so I'll, I'll I'll use it here. Um, um, but yeah, your point is so well taken. Is that 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 we rely on our mass communication practitioners, on our journalists to, to tell us the truth. And this is of course the benchmark of their professional identity. However, what is clear or what seems clear 
is what my dear friend and colleague Terry Flew uh, in Australia at the University of Sydney calls, says that the truth is not enough anymore, right? Is that that truth without trust is meaningless. And, and that is a, 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 a profound insight that he shared with us last year uh, when he was the president of the International Communication Association in his presidential address. This is the point that he made. And, and, and it's, 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 it's a profound insight, but it's also rather shocking, right? Because if, if I talk with journalists, and look, I run a journalism master's program here at the University of Amsterdam, and, so, and I talk with my students uh, who are all working journalists as well, and I have to tell them, like, you know, so f we train you to tell the truth, and we train you these techniques to get to the truth and to, to, to work the truth into stories that are beautiful and meaningful and have impact and all that kind of stuff and take responsibility for your professional work and all of this but i have to tell you it won't be enough that is uh, as as one student said told me the other day because i asked him so how does this make you feel when i say this and she told me she was thinking and she said Duke mark it makes me feel that i'm not enough that 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 all this work that i'm doing Again, often without decent pay, without being, you know, really valued or invested in by your news organization in precarious circumstances and during the pandemic working from home and, 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 and giving it all they've got and it's not enough. That is, that is well, it's depressing. And, and so how can you cope with that? And it's like, okay, what else is needed? And sure, we can say that's trust, but trust is a complicated concept, of course. And at the heart of trust is experience. In other words, we are more likely to trust something or someone when we've had a direct personal experience with them that proved to be beneficial to us. Uh, like we, we review a restaurant positively when we went to dinner there with our families and we had a great time. And we said, five stars, this was great. So that's trust. Uh, um, and, 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 and I think that's perhaps the key to answering your question for me, is that, that how can you make journalism something that is, isn't just a story that is being broadcast, a, a mass communicated, printed in a newspaper, put on a website somewhere, but also an experience that you have that turned out beneficially for you. Um, um, I'll, I'll give you a very concrete example, and I, I appreciate that, that, that this is not possible for all journalists and all news organizations, but still is that uh, it turns out that the most successful campaigns that local newspapers here in the Netherlands have had in the past with getting new subscribers and, and, and a better sort of uh, um, score in trust uh, towards their titles was when they... Um, uh, hired a, a bus, buses, and parked the bus in the center of town on a market square and had some of their journalists just sitting in the bus and inviting people to come in to talk with them and tell them what was going on in their communities, what, what they felt important issues and stories were. And the journalists would then actually then go and write these stories or cover these stories. And, and, and simply having that personal connection and experience and conversation really added to the credibility and trustworthiness of these titles. Now, not every journalist can do that, and, and, I, and, and I appreciate that, but, but it is an interesting point to make is that, that journalism isn't just about telling the truth, it's also having, ha, ma making people experience uh, um, uh, what the, the journalists themselves. And uh, perhaps social media can add to that. I mean, journalists all around the world are struggling. What do I do with social media? If I put something on, uh, I get trolls attacking me. When I'm a female journalist, I get bullied and harassed. When I'm a minority journalist, uh, I get racist and xenophobic attacks. And, and I, I deeply appreciate that. And I, I want to finish my answer to your question with another anecdote that for me was really powerful. A couple of years ago, a group of uh, German journalists who had uh, who have minority backgrounds, um, they were talking with each other in a bar and and sharing all the horrible emails and and tweets they get simply for being 
you know, having being of Arab descent, for example, like they're, you know, they're, they're German citizens, they're journalists, but they have Arab descent or Arab sounding names even. And they were telling us like all this racist racism they, they were facing and, and people hating on them. And, uh, and they couldn't help at some point, but laugh. Like, like, I mean, that's the only way to deal with that, that kind of evil, right? And, and, uh, and then one of them said like, we should, we should do something with this. So in a local bar, in an open mic night, they stood up in front of the microphone and read some of these emails to the people in the bar. And it turned out it was a hit. People were both shocked and they were laughing because it's just too ridiculous, the kind of stuff that you get. And then they turned this into a theater show and they toured the country. And this turned out to be incredibly powerful. It was powerful for them because they took agency back from the haters. And it was powerful to audiences realizing, making them realize this is what the people that provide us the news go through on a date. And especially if you're not white and you're not a man, this is the stuff that you're dealing with. <clears throat> and that, I thought that was a profound move and a deeply inspiring one. Now, I realize it's a tiny little example, but it, it, it talks a little bit to, um, uh, to your, your, your question. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Fillmore Murillo. Now we have uh, Professor Michelle B. Hastia, Faculty Department of Mass Communication from Pamantasan ng Lunsod ng Maynila. Good, uh, good day, everyone. Good day, good day, sir. So, sir, I, actually, you have already introduced uh, my question about um, bullying and uh, shaming, body shaming, and about cancel culture. Uh, what is your idea about that, knowing that since uh, a lot of us is in, in the digital platform these days and emotions are high and therefore these attacks are also high. So how can we really counter all of this, knowing that a lot of people are really putting their heart out there no, in the digital world and uh, they become vulnerable and it's open for attack for, for such things like cancel culture, bullying, racial discriminations body shaming and such. Any idea about this, sir? Thank you so much. And I appreciate you continuing this conversation. It's such an important one to have, especially for somebody like me. Look, I'm, I'm a middle-aged white guy, right? I mean, what can I say about the bullying and body shaming that my female colleagues and friends are going through on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, it, it would be... E I mean, it would be ridiculous for me to, to either belittle the problem or make it bigger than it really is because it doesn't happen to me, at least not in, not, not in, the, not in the slightest compared to what they are going through. And, and so, so I, I do want to recognize that. On the other hand, as my colleagues often remind me, it's like exactly people like me who need to stand up, right? And, and, and the people who don't get this <laughs> should say, look, this, this is not okay. So, so so in that sense, I do want to take responsibility. Um, well, I think one way of, of thinking about this is, in, is as an extension of the argument I made in my presentation, which is to appreciate that the digital environment um, uh, uh, um, requires an emotional literacy. That, that uh, you're, you're so right, tensions are running high in the world today for perfectly understandable reasons. I mean, life is precarious as is, the pandemic has amplified all the kind, all the precarities and, and inequalities that are already exist. Um, people feel scared, insecure, uh, and, and, and of course they should. There, there's nothing easy or, or secure about any of this that's going on. And, 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 and we express that online. And, and I, I am heartened by the fact that the majority of those expressions are caring and loving. We remember, uh, I mean, I don't know about the Philippines, but I do think there was worldwide, um, especially in the, uh, in the first months of the pandemic, uh, a, a true appreciation for healthcare workers. Like we stood outside and gave them applause and, 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 and you know, we had special emoji for them and, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, let's first remind us that the majority of these emotional expressions are caring, are loving, are empathic. And, 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 you know, humanity is generally okay. <laughs> However, there's a couple of people out there that are really not okay. The vast majority of them are men. 
and 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 so 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 let's also appreciate that 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 and what men generally lack much more than women not because they're men but because of their upbringing is emotional literacy right let's just acknowledge that right front and center men are not in touch with their emotions because they're men but because they're raised in our popular culture doesn't speak to their emotions and i think that that's that's that, that's something and you look that, that we need to address and that's why i make such a big deal out of digital literacy being including emotional literacy um, I think a second thing is to make our, especially our media professionals, uh, much more aware if they're not already that they never should do any of this on their own. It's like when I give my students advice of like how to make it work in the media industry today, and, and as some of you know, this is part of my research, how the media industry works. I always tell them my, my most profound advice is like, don't do this alone. Right? I mean, don't try to make it on your own. Form a network, form a collective, join a union, uh, organize yourself informally or, or formally. Um, that also means that you'll have a network of people to, to trust and to talk with when you are being bullied, when you are being harassed. I mean, we all have formal recourse there, right? We can report and all that kind of stuff, but there's an important social support element to all of this too. Um, so I think that's the second one. And a third one, and I think my prediction would be is that that's what we're going to see happen in the, in, in the upcoming years, is that there's going to be much more careful documentation, both in academic research as well as in documentaries and in journalism, of the emotional toll and consequences of the digitalization of everything. I think, we, and we already see this happening now, is that we're beginning to realize like something has happened in the last couple of years, not just the pandemic, but the acceleration of the digital environment. And this has human consequences. And, and a lot of them are good because you mentioned cancel culture. Well, let's not forget that cancel culture is a small part of a much broader phenomenon where media audiences are participating in the production of media, right? Where they calling on news organizations or on entertainment groups to continue a franchise to demand a new season of their favorite show to 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 i mean the reason why we have more star wars movies is because fans kept calling for them for 20 years now i if you don't care about star wars that makes you very depressed but if you do then that's really exciting so there's also a positive element to this and i think that's actually the majority however cancel culture is is quite intense and especially to the people involved so I think we're going to see much more careful documentation, not superficial, but careful documentation of the consequence. And I, I mentioned superficial because you may remember that one of the biggest hits for Netflix last year was this documentary called The Social Dilemma, which was a documentary about the dangerous side effects of our, our use of social media. And while some of the points made in documentary were certainly valid. Overall, the documentary was for us as media scholars, incredibly superficial, uh, sensationalist. Um, it also was sort of rehashing very old critiques of media that for those of us in media studies, when we, we knew this from, this, from television in the 1970s, and, and it was sort of like cheap. Uh, uh, and, and but I do think we're going to get more balanced, nuanced uh, appraisals, both in academia as well in popular culture. And I, I really look forward to that of, of raising and, and making people more aware of when they engage in the digital environment emotionally, that that gets co-opted by populist politicians and by people wanting to earn a profit. And that that in turn shapes how they look at the world. And, and, and it doesn't mean that media are bad or evil. It just means that if we understand and appreciate uh, um, the emotional uh, consequences, uh, that'll empower us to take better action against the kind of people that exploit us in this space. Okay, uh, Mark, before we, we move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Mansell is already here. We have uh, one more question for you from uh, Ms. Jazel Yaneli Manaba, Director, Office of Public Affairs from Tarlac State University. 
Good day, good day everyone. Good day, Ms. Tony, Dr. Mark, to all participants and organizers. While listening to Dr. Mark, I had several realizations on the importance of teaching communication in media to all, not just to communication majors. Mm -hmm. And banking on the relevance of, or the continued relevance of mass media, I'd like to say that media and communication studies are not only relevant when it comes to discussing data on COVID cases and sending out reminders for everyone to keep safe. Media communication studies in a global pandemic also means reaching out to people to inform them and prevent the prevalence of misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, and deep fakes, especially now that we, or at least Filipinos, are normally stuck at home due to quarantine restrictions. And we won't know what's up and running outside our homes if media and communication are not available. But it's not only about availability, it's also about making people understand how media and communication work. For example, in a book that I've read from John Vivian, that media, it says that media cover disorder to restore social order. And banking on what you have said, Dr. Mark, that there is no consensus on emotional life that we need to train to keep, to, that we need to train ourselves to keep listening. Um, there's something that, an, an anecdote that I'd like to share, shor a short anecdote that there's someone that I know that she hates watching the news because this past six years, what she normally sees on TV are the never ending killings, deaths due to the pandemic and chaos, especially in politics. And I'd like to educate her that the primary reason or the primary purpose of news is to tell the public the facts and it's up to the public to internalize that actions must be done to have a decent community again. And this leads me to the question, can there be or how can we have a universal approach to explain how media and communication work and make people appreciate it, let alone understand how it, how it works, especially now that in the Philippines, somehow the, the public generally distrusts media because of accusations of being biased, despite the Nobel Peace Prize of Maria Ressa. Like, how can we translate research, research results on communication and media in such a way that can be understood by people from all walks of life? Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. And of course, I mean, this this would require an answer that will take us, you know, for a couple of more hours, and I won't do that, I promise. Um, I will say this, um, um, last year and the year before, our dear friend and colleague Silvio Weisbord released two books um, on the future of communication, media and communication as a discipline, uh, both published with Polity Press. And I, I mentioned this because in these books, he makes, among many other things, the case, two, two, two really important points that speak to, to, to your question. The first one is to suggest that what media communication studies should do is to prevent itself from becoming a discipline like psychology or sociology or medicine or something. In other words, a discipline that is constantly preoccupied with boundarying itself off from other disciplines and, and worrying about what's our unique story. And it's like, no, we are a post discipline, right? The beauty of our field is that we touch all other fields and we take from them too, right? It's like a, we are bricoleurs uh, to, to use an anthropological term. We, we take methods from psychology and we take theories from sociology and we take our, our appreciation of power from anthropology and political science. We, and, and, and then we have this unique understanding and appreciation of media, most importantly, how difficult media are. And, and so I think we should never forget that. Is that and, and like what you said about uh, everybody should have a study communication, right? Everybody should study media. Um, and, 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 and we can only make that happen if we stop trying to be a discipline and embrace us as a post-discipline that serves everyone and takes from everyone. A second point that, that Silvio is making that I really subscribe to is the notion and the, and the, and the increased appreciation of public scholarship. I, I mean, mean, and and I think if it doesn't exist at your place of work, at your university, at your school, then it's something we should advocate for. Uh, an appreciation that your work as a scholar shouldn't just appear in peer-reviewed scholarly journals that are locked away in libraries somewhere. Of course, it should be open access and those kind of things, but it should also be public. You know, blog, tweet. Uh, uh, and, and I mean, do, do, you, and but not don't do it alone. Do it as a network because you're going to get harassed. <laughs> but um, 
And so I want to finish my, my comment with something that I really enjoyed last week. As we all know, Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram shut down for, for, for a couple of hours. Worldwide panic. Uh, and in some cases, like a genuine one, right? If WhatsApp is your only means of existence and communication, like for so many people, like for example, in Brazil, is this is a profound, uh, was a profound moment. And um, so the next day, uh, there were uh, news organizations in the Netherlands uh, uh, that were calling me like, Mark, Mark, you have to come and talk to about this. And then because I've said stuff about this in the past. And I, in the end, I decided to join um, a incredibly cheesy commercial television talk show to talk about this. The talk show that normally talks about music and theater and have celebrities and everything. And uh, but I, I really like the vibe in that show. And um, and, 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 and it was actually a lovely experience. And in the end, they said, they asked me the same question you asked me. It's like, what are we gonna do? Like, you know, how do we gonna navigate the world when we're so dependent on these platforms? And I got to say what, uh, something you just said, and then I think we can share with everybody. It's like, well, I think everybody should study media studies. <laughs> and they were all laughing and say, well, I guess you've got a couple of new students after tonight. And well, okay, that was that was fun, but I mean it. It's like uh, I design my undergraduate courses to be open for everyone, to not just be for media studies students to pre prepare them for a career in media studies. It's like no, I just deliberately do all my talks, all my lectures, in a way that is I hope speaks to everybody, rather just than to people inside the discipline. And this is a deliberate choice I've made um, because I feel that what we study touches everything and everyone. Uh, and that's one way of, 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 of approaching, at least for me, to take some responsibility. 